Hi everyone, I'm going to be sharing this message in Spanish and then in English. Hola a todos, voy a compartir este mensaje en español y después en inglés. Um, please refer to the image on the screen for some instructions on English uh, to Spanish interpretation. Eh, por favor, refiérense a la imagen en la pantalla para instrucciones de interpretación del inglés al español. Soy Pau, uso los pronombres ella y ellis y soy trabajadora de lenguaje con el colectivo Babilla, colectivo transfeminista antirracista de justicia del lenguaje, y estaré interpretando este evento simultáneamente del inglés al español junto a Cristóbal. I'm Pau, I use they them pronouns, I'm a language justice worker with Babilla Collective, it's a transfeminist anti-racist language justice group, and we will be providing simultaneous interpretation for today's event from English to Spanish with my colleague Cristóbal. En un momento verán una notificación a la derecha de la pantalla en el fondo de un icono de globo que dice interpretación. Ahí pueden escoger escuchar la interpretación del inglés o al español. También hay una opción de silenciar el audio original y solo escuchar el intérprete. Si están usando una aplicación de Zoom en su teléfono inteligente, por favor, hacer clic en los tres puntitos y escoger el lenguaje que prefieren escuchar. In a moment, you will see a notification on the right bottom hand of your screen. It's going to be a globe icon that says interpretation. And there you can choose to hear the interpretation to English or Spanish. You also have the option of silencing the original audio and only hearing the interpreter. If you're using a smartphone, you can click on the three dots and choose your language that you prefer. The interpretation will begin now. La interpretación comenzará ahora. And now I pass it on to Nia and hope that you have a wonderful event. Ahora se lo paso a Nia y que tengan buen evento. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nia Iman Smith and I'm the Community Engagement Associate at BRIC. For those of you who are unfamiliar with BRIC, we are a leading arts and media institution anchored in downtown Brooklyn, whose work spans contemporary visual and performing arts, media, and civic action. For over 40 years, our institution has helped shape Brooklyn's cultural and media landscape by presenting and incubating work by artists, creators, students, and media makers. Today, we are so honored to once again partner with Brooklyn Defender Services and Witness for the launch of our virtual Stoop Share season. In its pre-COVID iteration, Stoop Share provided the opportunity to share our unique venue and production resources with our neighboring nonprofits for their public programs. Since we are temporarily unable to host on-site programs at Brick House, we are offering Stoop Share as a virtual program for our fall season. To learn more about the program and how to participate, please feel free to contact me at n, as in Nia, smith at brickartsmedia.org. I thank you for joining us today, and I now introduce you to this afternoon's moderator, Juan Elescante. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me today, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. My name is Juan Escalante. I'm a DACA recipient and a longtime immigration advocate. I've been at the forefront of various immigration fights, and I continue to fight for equality, justice, and representation for immigrants who may be facing deportation and other hardships across the country. It's my pleasure to join today's panel as a moderator and introduce everyone here today. We'll be happy to hear from a variety of different speakers, including Alika Makam the Senior Program Manager at U.S. Programs from Witness, Abby Goldberg, the President of Varian Strategies, Michael Kleiman, the Executive Director of Media Tank, Nyasa Hickey, Director of Immigration Initiatives at Brooklyn Defense Prod Services, and Paul Lebron and Cristobal Gran, who uh, kindly uh, introduced themselves uh, as the interpreters from Babilla, uh, Babilla Collective. We'll also hear from Michael Kleiman, the Executive Director of Media Tank, who I uh, aforementioned uh, named. So it's my pleasure to be here today. I'll have some questions for the panelists. And if there's anything that I can be helpful for, I'll be happy to take your questions in here as well. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function. And it's now my pleasure to turn it to Nyasa Hickey, Director of Immigration Initiatives at Brooklyn Defender Services, a public defender office. Nyasa, we are currently dealing with a global pandemic. 
Does that mean that Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, uh, has stopped conducting their informant, enforcement operations. And can you expand on that? Hi, good afternoon, Juan. Thank you for introducing us. Um, no, unfortunately, ICE has not stopped enforcement. While there was some reduced enforcement um, at the beginning of the pandemic, ICE has restarted raids as of the summer. And in fact, there have been a few uh, major ICE operations specifically focused on sanctuary cities um, in the fall. So we are seeing ICE resume their regular operations, which not only means that people are being arrested and ripped from their homes and families and put in ICE detention where there is a high risk of getting COVID and the conditions are terrible. But we are also seeing that they are um, using the same tactics they were using before, which includes ruses, so ICE pretending to be police, um, ICE pretending to uh, be investigating a crime and therefore um, convincing people to open their doors or convincing people to give over the locations of their loved ones. They're also using mobile, mobile fingerprint machines, so they're carrying around fingerprinting devices and not only asking or requesting, or in, as they presented, demanding people submit to mobile fingerprinting who are the targets of the ICE arrest, but also collateral arrests. So other people who may be in the home or in the apartment building, people they're running into who may look or uh, look Latinx or um, speak a different language basically using racial profiling. So these are just some of the tactics that they're using. Another thing that we recently saw is that they're now demanding cell phones and cell phone access, um, which is a relatively new trend. Um, and they're, they're getting some information from people's cell phones. So that's why it's so important that everybody in this audience and everybody in the country watch our videos that we have rights videos and also figure out how to or understand how to uh, ethically and responsibly and safely document these ice arrests and i'll just note also that even though we have a change in the administration coming up um, i anticipate that these raids these ice arrests will continue they occurred under the obama administration they did severely escalate and target a really broad swath of people under the Trump administration, but I expect that we will need to continue to fight for the rights of immigrants and their human rights and help to document ICE abuses, even under a new administration. Thank you so much for all that explanation. I think that for me, uh, as someone who was with, has been witness of some of these tactics that Niasa mentioned is increasingly um, important for people to uh, adhere to the advice. There is essentially, re there are essentially resources out there to make sure that you and your loved ones are protected, but there's also information out there on how to essentially confront the situation if you are a bystander and do so in a very safe manner because a lot of the video footage that emerges often leads to us keeping a much, much more protected community and helping others around us. Thank you so much for that information, Niasa. It's now my pleasure to uh, introduce Holly McCom, the media activist and senior US program coordinator at Witness. She currently supports immigrant in their use for video documentation and storytelling as tools to fight for immigrant rights in and out of the courtroom. I'll turn it over to Polly. Thank you so much, Juan. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for having us. It's great to be in community with you all today. Um, as Juan said, part of my role at Witness is to lead our immigrant rights work through a project called Eyes on Ice. And through this project, we train immigrant communities and allies, uh, journalists, lawyers to document abuses. We collaborate on projects and we also have a, a ton of accessible resources that we've created through the project, um, like tip sheets on how to film ice safely, uh, information about your right to record, considerations you should uh, keep in mind before you share videos, case studies, etc. So we'll be sharing some links to those resources in the chat, so definitely check them out. 
all our resources are available in multiple languages as well. So I wanted to share a little bit about why I do this work, why video. So, you know, we've seen over and over again how powerful video is for human rights around the world from, you know, George Floyd to protesters this summer using video as a tool to help verify their truth and even combat false police reports in many cases, to live streams showing police and military violence in Brazil's favelas, uh, journalists documenting war crimes in Syria, genocide in Burma. The International Criminal Court has even issued an arrest warrant against a Libyan military commander based on video evidence found on social media. So we know that video has been instrumental around the world in helping to expose human rights abuses and give people power to control their narratives and force uh, transparency from perpetrators of abuse and authorities. And transparency or rather the lack thereof is especially important to know when we're talking about immigration enforcement, ICE and, and border patrol. You know, there's a, there's a reason why ICE is known for using ruses or manipulative tactics to try to get people to let them into their homes or to, you know, get outside of their homes. And there's a reason why ICE often conducts their enforcements in the dead of night or in the or early hours of the morning. It's because their success is contingency on secrecy. It's contingent on secrecy and a lack of transparency. You know, they're counting on immigrants to open the door to not know their rights, to not know how ICE operates. And they're also counting on those outside of directly impacted communities to not care and to not know what's going on. You know, ICE was terrorizing communities long before Donald Trump, but our ability to expose ICE, to create pressure, to bring their inhumane tactics out from the shadows and into the mainstream is now greater than ever. And, and I think video is playing a really crucial role in creating that exposure. Um, but, you know, I just want to note that, of course, video is not a magic wand. We know that all too well here in the United States that that video too often doesn't, uh, you know, lead to justice in or out of a courtroom setting. But it does make it harder for people to deny what's happening. It creates a record of abuse that, you know, we haven't always had as a tool before. And it's slowly helping to shift the narrative around immigrants and immigration enforcements in this country. You know, just because there's a policy or law that says ICE is allowed to do something doesn't mean that it's right. You know, what's the law and what is ethical have never quite been aligned. And I think a video is helping us to expose that and also to learn how we as a community of both directly impacted people and, and allies can fight back. So I want to quickly share one of the examples of how video has been used in the past few years to defend immigrant rights. I'm going to share my screen. Can folks see my screen? Someone just give me a thumbs up. Cool. Um, so we're set. Awesome, thank you. So this picture here is of a man named Juan Hernandez. Uh, he was targeted and arrested by ICE agents in Los Angeles, California in uh, 2017. Juan was at his job at a mechanic shop where he'd worked for the past seven years when suddenly six ICE agents stormed the shop with semi-automatic weapons drawn, as you can see in this image here. And even though they only had a deportation order for the shop's owner, the agents ended up handcuffing everyone who worked there, including Juan. Uh, the agents arrested him with, you know, no probable cause, no warrant, no previous information about him or contact with him. He was clearly racially profiled and arrested based solely on the color of his skin. So Juan was actually detained for five weeks uh, before his family and community were able to fundraise for his bail. And after he was released on bail, his lawyers were able to successfully get his deportation proceedings terminated by claiming that his Fourth Amendment right had been violated uh, during this arrest. And what was crucial to the successful legal argument was the fact that the entire raid had been captured on the mechanic shop surveillance video. So this image here is actually a screenshot from the surveillance camera from outside of the mechanic store. So I think most importantly, the footage helped corroborate Juan's story and, and bring some weight to his testimony. Um, but it also, you know, exposed that the agents didn't identify themselves, they didn't have a warrant, um, you know, that Juan wasn't a, a flight risk, etc. So the video was was really instrumental in the legal victory but in addition to the legal victory, which was of course huge, the ACLU also made an advocacy video using the same surveillance footage and uh, 
interviews from Juan and his family that was shared widely on social media and helped to bring attention to uh, the way ICE operates. Because like I said earlier, even if ICE is technically allowed to you know, only wear identification that says police and storm a mechanic shop like a, a SWAT team, it doesn't mean that it's okay. And, you know, exposing this behavior to the mainstream media and public is crucial in, uh, you know, us being able to raise awareness and create pressure and galvanize change. Um, so I wanted to share a little clip. Uh, it's just a way to end this section on a positive note. So I was actually there the day that Juan was uh, able to uh, be released from the detention center and reunited with his wife and daughter. So I just want to share this moment because it's a really beautiful moment. living okay. hell. Okay. intense moment to see people come out of jail and meet their loved ones for the first time. But it's also a beautiful moment to see that community pressure led to this moment being able to happen. Sometimes these... So we'll share the link to this full case study uh, and this video in the chat, but I just wanted to share that moment there because, you know, video is powerful. It's a powerful tool if it's used safely and ethically, which is why we created this We Have Rights video on documenting ICE to ensure that more people know how to film and how to find and utilize video like this surveillance footage in this example uh, for immigrant rights. So I'll leave it at that and, and pass it back to you, Juan. To, to you, Juan. Thank you so much. And again, as someone who continues, has been in, in, in immigration for quite some time, I can't help but, you know, almost shed a tear for some of the, the footage in there because some of the emotion that is uh, portrayed through that video of family reunification is so, it's just so strong that um, it, it, it's really moving. And I, I agree with everything that Polly just mentioned. Um, for us, uh, as, uh, uh, as advocates, it's important to not just document these injustices at the hands of the government, but it's also for us to show the face and the humanity that a lot of these people uh, have in terms of their families, the impact in their communities and beyond. So uh, again, thank you to Polly for that example and all the work that, she, uh, that they're doing over at Witness. Uh, to, to bring us this story. So I hope that folks will continue to take a look uh, through the links and the resources put in the chat and beyond. I wanted to take a moment now and shift the conversation over to Abby Goldberg, the president of Varian Strategies and co-director and co-producer of the We Have Rights series. She will take a moment now to introduce the campaign and the video that we'll watch today. Abby. Thank you so much, Juan and everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to provide some brief context and an introduction to the We Have Rights campaign and to the newest We Have Rights video, We Have Rights When Documenting ICE Arrests, which you're about to see here. First, a little history. Brooklyn Defender Services was one of the first public defender organizations in the country to provide universal representation to every detained immigrant ICE tried to deport from New York. In 2017, they faced a challenge. Brooklyn Defender Services lawyers were unable to respond to the growing demand for information from immigrants about their rights after increasingly nefarious and aggressive ICE raids ramped up after Trump took office in 2017. After looking around to see what information existed already and finding limited resources available, especially in languages other than Spanish and English, we came up with a solution. Variant Strategies and Media Tank began working with Brooklyn Defender Services and other immigrant rights groups to come up with a series of videos to help fill the gap in information. 
In 2018, we launched the first phase of the We Have Rights campaign. It consisted of four videos in seven languages, so 28 videos in total, narrated by famous voice talent. The videos used human stories to share with immigrants what to do if confronted by, by ICE in the four most common situations the Brooklyn Defender Services lawyers heard about from clients. We felt strongly about pro producing the videos in the seven most common immigrant languages in New York, English, Spanish, Haitian Creole, Russian, Mandarin, Arabic, and Urdu, to make them as broadly accessible as possible. To create the most useful videos we could for immigrant communities we were working with, Brooklyn Defender Services convened a focus group of people they represent, as well as activists and leaders of organizations working with undocumented communities. This group provided invaluable feedback on the script and the main characters. The first phase of the We Up Right series includes videos that explain your rights, when ICE is at your door, when ICE enters our homes, when ICE is on the streets, and if we're arrested by ICE. These videos can be found at www.wehaverights.us. Then in 2019, based on the success of the original videos and further needs in the immigrant community sparked by ongoing ICE raids, Brooklyn Defender Services developed a collaboration with Witness, who as Polly spoke about, work closely with immigrant populations to document violations of their rights to create another film as part of this series. This video, the one we're about to watch today, covers how to document ICE arrests safely, effectively, and ethically. The video was intended for immigrants and bystanders alike and launched this past August. The video could not have come at a more important time. The U.S. runs the largest immigrant jail network in the world, in which it jails about half a million immigrants a year. In addition to those jailed, hundreds of thousands are deported each year. Starting in January 2020, ICE increased its raids in the New York City area. There were 143 ICE raids in the first 11 weeks of 2020, over 400 percent more than in the last 11 weeks of 2019. These trends were mirrored across the country. Like with the first videos, BDS and Witness convened a focus group for immigrants, and this time non-immigrants as well, which provided critical feedback on the story, the, the script, and distribution. This video was created in Spanish and English. In English, it was narrated by Fiona Apple, who has been an ardent supporter of immigrant and refugee rights. It is the last in the We Have Rights series and is particularly important for this moment when not only so many people want to help stand for our immigrant neighbors, but as we'll hear later, as ICE has resumed their home, street, and workplace attacks on our communities. Please watch this video carefully. Our intention is not to scare people, but to empower all of us with information that's critical to protecting our rights and to protecting one another. On his way to work one morning, Abdi noticed an SUV in front of his neighbor Andrea's home. When Andrea came outside, two men approached her. It was ICE. ICE stands for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. If you witness ICE or any law enforcement agents making an arrest in public, it is your right to film the interaction as long as you do not interfere with the arrest. ICE doesn't always respect these rights and sometimes will target the person filming. So always assess your personal risk before hitting record. If you're not comfortable filming, that's okay. You can still document the arrest by taking notes on what happens or simply bearing witness. This is all scary, but remember, we have rights. When documenting an arrest, film openly and comply with any instructions the agents give you. If the agents tell you to stop filming, you can tell them, I am exercising my right to document this arrest. Abdi let Andrea know that he was there to support her and document the agent's behavior. If the agents ask you to step back, document yourself complying and continue filming if you feel comfortable. Always keep your camera focused on law enforcement, not the person being arrested or their family members. 
showing their identities can make them vulnerable to retaliation. The agents claimed to have a warrant, but it was not signed by a judge. Be sure to capture details like any documents the agents are carrying, as well as weapons, badges, and uniforms. Capture context, such as street signs, landmarks, and any other cameras that are present, but don't stop recording in between shots. If the agents become violent, remain calm and allow your footage to speak for itself. If you do narrate, focus on facts, such as time of day and number of agents. Do not reveal the identity of the person being detained, their immigration status, or their criminal history. Anything the agents learn during an arrest can be used in court. ICE does not have the right to confiscate your phone or to delete your footage, but they may try anyway. Lock your phone with at least a six-digit passcode. Your passwords are protected under your Fifth Amendment right, but fingerprint ID, facial recognition, and pattern lock are not. Andrea was arrested. Other videos in this series will help you understand what your rights are if ICE arrests you or stops you in your community. After filming, make a copy of your footage on a separate device and don't change the file name. If you edit the footage, do so from a copy. This will help the original stand up as evidence in court. Abdi did not post the footage to social media or live stream it, knowing that doing so could expose him and Andrea's family to retaliation. Instead, he shared it with Andrea's family and their lawyer. They decided how to release it. Your footage will be more effective when released strategically in partnership with a lawyer, an advocacy organization, or a reputable journalist. If you witness ICE making an arrest, remember, you have rights. Great. So now I'll we'll talk briefly about distribution and impact. These videos have now been seen over 23 million times, helping millions of immigrants from around the country to defend their rights. The success of the campaign was based on the videos themselves, as well as the result of a concerted distribution effort. From the start with our focus group and other immigrant rights groups we worked with, we, ach we achieved buy-in from key community partners who both informed and helped with distribution. The focus group in particular helped us understand what channels immigrants were using to learn about their rights and generally to communicate. Then we created a network of dozens of distribution partners, mostly immigrant rights organizations, who helped us spread the word. A big aspect of our distribution strategy was working with famous voice talent. Not only did they share the videos with their followings, but especially in the case of this last video, were a big part of what got the media to pay attention. For this last video, Fiona Apple had just come out with her new album, the first in a decade, and there was already buzz surrounding her when this video launched. It led to dozens of articles in print and television media, both in English and Spanish, and in a few other languages. On our end, we developed social media toolkits, graphics for promotion, sample posts for all social media channels, and got this out to our distribution partners and our voice talent who helped share the videos online and with their communities. We've also taken opportunities like this to screen the videos. The videos, both this one and the original videos, have also been used in trainings across the country. They are embedded in United We Dream's Notifica app. They are being used in ESL curriculum at the New York City Public Library, and they are being shown in service provider waiting rooms around the country. We are proud to share this video with you this afternoon and hope you'll also be a champion in spreading the message to your communities. Thank you.
it's a very important uh, reminder for folks, of course, that uh, this video is not intended to scare people, but to empower them with information that's critical to protecting our rights and protecting one another. Abby, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. I wasn't sure if we would screen the, um, uh, I believe here, it's just the English version. For some reason I had mistaken here with, this, with a separate version of here. I wanted to kind of just hear from you in terms of like further distribution, how people can get access to this video in terms of they want to share it with their networks. Yeah, um, great question. So all of the videos are available at www.wehaverights.us. Um, you can also Google, uh, yeah, um, it's in the chat for anyone who needs it. Um, it's written out there. And you can also Google, we have rights when documenting ICE arrests and it will show up. Amazing, thank you for that. Actually, and there's also a We Have Rights Facebook page. For uh, people to know about, especially if you're an immigrant, but even as much so, more so if you're a neighbor or if you're a friend or if you're an ally to a lot of these communities, because the information is so impactful. As someone who has experienced the fear and anxiety of getting that door knock in early mornings, in early hours of the morning, I can tell you that it's resources like this that continue to in, essentially empower us and let us know how to act, behave, and protect one another, especially communities that may be in rural parts of the country that may not have access uh, to a lot of uh, advocacy organizations or legal defend, the, the, defend organizations. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. Well, now I'll turn it over to Michael, the co-director and co-producer of the We Have Rights series, who will tell us a little bit more about the production process of this video. Yeah. Thank you very much, Juan, and, and thanks, Abby, for that important overview of the distribution. Um, you know, the, the, the idea for this fifth video came out, as people have said, from the original four. The original four touched on the importance of documentation uh, in little tidbits throughout in terms of taking photos of what happens or um, friends being able to film things they see. And Witness had actually used the original four videos as part of their trainings um, about two years ago. Uh, after the first four videos came out, we did a brick stoop share like this one back when we could actually go to the brick uh, space and do these in person. And Holly was on the panel along with Abby. And that sort of led to a conversation about doing a video specifically about document, documenting uh, ICE arrests and ICE abuses. Um, and so once we started going, you know, there's a couple of strategies we've employed. Uh, across the board on all five videos now that I think were really important to this one. One was thinking about the audience. Um, the audience for all five of these videos, especially this, this one, is really twofold. I think most importantly, um, it's impacted communities, immigrant communities in the US who, who are in need of this information and trying to empower them to be able to defend their rights in any number of the situations we, we get into in the films. And then the second audience is a, a broader audience, a general public who we want to, in this case, empower to be able to document ICE abuses and ICE arrests when they see them, but also more generally just to understand um, what's being done by their government to their neighbors. Um, and, and that's where I think we really had to think creatively about creating a, a video that felt more cinematic than more emotional than a typical PSA. We've been really lucky, really lucky to partner with Brooklyn Defender Services across the videos, and in this case, Witness, who are very much open to making something that felt very cinematic. And, and we did that in a few different ways. I think most importantly is through narrative, right? All five of the videos um, aren't just throwing out information. There's a lot of information in them, but they're all framed within stories about individuals. Uh, so you can see the, the experience through their eyes, in this case, Andrea and Abdi. Um, so that was the first, really grounding each of these in stories. Uh, then was bringing in various cinematic elements, whether, you know, most obviously the visuals. We worked with a great partner in Flora Films, of the animation studio that we worked with, uh, and really trying to uh, have cinematic angles, lots of movement, and so, you know, you have the overhead angles, the low angles, to really make this feel 
uh, like you're watching uh, something more dramatic than a PSA. We worked with Dan Teicher in creating uh, an emotional score that would be sort of haunt haunting at times and empowering. Um, and then we worked with Flavor Lab, which is a great audio post-production house who did all the detailed sound design to really make it a three-dimensional environment. So really bring the viewers in, again, not to scare people, uh, but to give them a sense of, um, to bring them in on the emotion uh, and, and to drive emotion, drive sharing online as well, and just to help the general public really understand the stakes. Um, and then also we really saw this as an opportunity visually to show people what these scenarios could look like. You know, obviously every situation will be different and ICE doesn't always behave as they should and as we depict uh, in the videos, but we wanted to get, let people visualize what might happen. Um, and so, for example, I remember with this video, the importance of, you know, how far away you should stand from ICE when you're filming. And I think we went back six or seven times on the storyboards, making sure Abdi had enough space between him and the ICE agents, because, you know, it, it's, it feels like a detail when you're making the video, but it, it's really important for people who are going to watch this and perhaps mimic what they see. And you realize that see, people's safety is, is really on the line here. So it's important to, to pay attention to those details. Um, all of the videos we were fortunate in that they came from really good source material. In the case of the first four, they were influenced heavily by the Immigrant Defense Project's work. They have a whole series on, on uh, knowing your rights. And in this case, as, as Polly mentioned, the Eyes on Ice, um, Eyes on Ice work that they that Witness had already done. And I really encourage people to check out those links because that's a really uh, more in depth uh, getting into what how to effectively document these instances. Um, and so our job as filmmakers was to one, bring these, um, this important information into the story and then figure out how we can make it as concise as possible while still conveying the really important information. So we did that you know, in a collaborative process with Witness and the lawyers at, at BDS. And then I think really importantly, once we had a first script bringing in uh, a focus group of uh, immigrant communities, BDS clients who were in, you know, undocumented themselves, many of them had experienced ICE raids, as well as activists working in this space. And some really, really important insights came, came from, those, uh, from that focus group. Uh, with, with this video, I mean, just a couple I know, there's a line in there about um, knowing that you, you know, sometimes ICE agents will target people who film. And so checking with your own comfort levels depending on your immigration status, you know, what, whatever it is, what you feel comfortable with and, and being honest with yourself about that came from that group and it was really important to include uh, because sometimes ICE agents do retaliate against people who are filming. Um, another one was Abdi's character was originally also going to be um, a Latino character, but you know, we, we felt we got the feedback from the group that it was really important to have representation, visual representation from immigrants from African countries. The other four videos uh, had other, um, other nations represented, but we didn't have someone from an African country. And so uh, Abdi is supposed to be a Somali immigrant. Um, and I think, you know, there was other, th from the, I remember from the original series when we did the first focus group, um, we, you know, the, the script is all, ICE might try this, ICE might do that, tell ICE this or that. And at the end of reading through this whole script, someone put up their hand, one of the participants and said, yeah, you know, what is ICE? Uh, and so just the importance of being able to, to let people know ICE is immigration and customs enforcement, right? That com that's not part of all five of the videos. So things like that were really critical in coming in, in the focus groups and working with um, people in that community and getting their, their feedback before we start the animation phase. Um, you know, lastly, I'll speak, I know Abby spoke about this a little bit, but um, working with voice talent and, you know, strategically choosing voice talent who could help leverage the videos. Abby spoke about Fiona Apple, who was, you know, we were really fortunate in the timing of it, and that was awesome. And then in the Spanish, we worked with Erika Andiola, who's a, uh, an advocacy officer at Raices, but has been a really important activist in this space for many, many years. Uh, and so having, again, a, a voice from that community who could literally be voicing the project was really, was really critical. So there, there was a lot of different elements to this. We tried to um, make the videos as emotionally powerful as possible while still being really informative and concise. And that I hope we were successful. Thank you so much, Michael, for that. And I think uh, I just want to kind of like 
uh, zoom or kind of highlight some of the things that you mentioned in terms of not just the voice talent, uh, but also breaking down uh, a lot of, uh, especially in immigration, sometimes uh, there's a lot of uh, concepts that are, as we call, you know, in, in the advocacy world, in the weeds for the general public that may not be familiar with certain agencies, their track record when it comes to behavior. So I think uh, breaking down uh, those specifics in tools like this is significantly powerful, but also bringing the fact in, into representation. Oftentimes people think that immigration is solely and nothing could be further from the truth. being impacted uh, and we continue to see the impact uh, continue to flow through um, African-American communities, Asian american communities, Latinx communities uh, who continue to um, unfortunately suffer at the practice of uh, uh, immigration enforcement agents who may not be following uh, the, the protocols or you know, communities as we continue to mention here who may not have all the information. So thank you so much for your insight and for your work on this. Wonderful. We'll go back to Nyasa Heki, who um, could hopefully tell us a little bit about how and whether these videos can be used into policy and legislation at the state and local level, and you know, hopefully also uh, at the federal level in here as well. Yeah, so um, Polly sort of gave an example of how the video was used in an individual case, and it can be extremely powerful. Um, I also want to just, uh, I think part of this advocacy is also understanding that uh, many people have the context of criminal court where suppression and um, rights under the Constitution are alive and well, although not always used um, as effectively as, as we wish they would. There are plenty of problems in the criminal legal system. But in the immigration system, unfortunately, uh, the exclusionary rule and um, concepts like violating the Constitution are, um, in a way they're turned on their head because the burden is on the respondent, the person who's trying, who needs to prove that they're eligible for a form of relief or eligible to stay in the United States. And so um, unfortunately the videos, while shocking, it's shocking to see people's rights being trampled on and um, the, the video that, or the, some of the images that Polly showed were, were horrendous. Um, Unfortunately, it's not always the key to winning an immigration case. So uh, there's actually, I'm gonna let Polly interject because I know that there's a talk next week on this. So if you're interested in learning specifically about how to use this information in immigration court, Polly's gonna just uh, talk about the event next week. Yeah, thank you, Niasa, and thank you for that reminder. You know, video, like I was saying, it's not a magic wand. It's also not gonna be the only tool in either your advocacy or your legal um, campaign work. You know, it's one piece of the larger puzzle. It's it's never going to be enough on its own. Um, and then, as Mia has said, you know, it, it's being able to understand the rules of evidence um, and make legal arguments within the immigration legal system looks very different from the criminal legal system. Um, but for the past two years, uh, we've been working with a legal fellow at Witness to actually explore this idea. Like, what would it look like to be able to submit more eyewitness video and be able to use eyewitness video from immigration enforcements um, in to, to defend immigrant rights in legal cases. So next week on Tuesday, December 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, Witness, Brooklyn Defender Services, and American Friends Service Committee are going to be co-hosting a virtual event for the launch of our newest resource as part of our Eyes on Ice project. And the resource is basically a, a two-part in-depth guide that actually walks immigration lawyers uh, and community advocates through the practical steps of how to film, store, and submit video as evidence in immigration legal proceedings. Juan's case that I shared earlier is just, you know, one of very, 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 very few. There's probably like four cases in the United States um, that were able to utilize video evidence in immigration. 
uh, in immigration work. So, you know, this is a new area and it's an evolving area, but there's also a lot of potential there. You know, we know video can be a powerful tool for advocacy. And, and we're also getting the sense that video can be a powerful tool for immigration legal proceedings, but it's not always clear how to use that video uh, for evidence or how to film in a way that's going to support a case, which is why we created this guide. Um, so we would love for folks to join if you're available. Um, I'll be moderating. There'll be another immigration lawyer from Brooklyn Defender Services, and we'll be hearing from the author of the guide, as well as a longtime community uh, filmer who's been documenting ICE and has used uh, footage uh, in successful advocacy campaigns um, over the last 10 years. So definitely tune in. We'll share the, uh, the RSVP link in the chat and Spanish interpretation will be available as well. Great. So as, as Polly's saying right now, the, there's been a somewhat limited, we've seen it be somewhat limited in terms of actual success in immigration court, but um, that doesn't mean that it can't, that can't change. And part of that is actually getting the documentation, getting this video evidence so that the lawyers can figure out how to use it. And it's, it's, what, it's a perfect example of the more it's um, used, the more judges are likely to accept it, the more judges are likely to become sensitized to these issues. And judges are people, and they are also definitely subject to public influence. And so the more that we um, publicize these ICE abuses, the more that judges might then also be receptive to these arguments and we can develop the case law. So that's, that's a big part of this. Um, but then also uh, Juan touched on um, advocacy, legislative and other types of advocacy. And um, th the documentation of ICE abuses, both video and other types of documentation was instrumental in the New York State um, Protect Our Courts Act, which is a piece of legislation that is currently pending in front of Governor Cuomo um, was passed by the Senate and the House, um, by, by the Assembly and the and, uh, in New York State. And the Protector Courts Act basically makes it illegal for ICE to arrest people in and around the courts, the New York State courts. So family courts, criminal courts, the civil courts. Um, and what was really compelling was the evidence, the body of evidence that was gathered by witnesses showing how ICE is stalking people on their way to courts, how they're sitting in court and uh, listening for people's names and, and the types of ruses and tactics that they're using. Um, and it also was instrumental in the uh, Southern District of New York court case about ICE arrests in and around the courts, which um, the judge granted a preliminary injunction. It's now on appeal. I appealed that, um, but that's just one example of how it's really is very, very important and effective. And having been um, very intimately involved with that campaign, both the the lawsuit and the legislation, I can tell you that it's very compelling for legislators, legislators or judges to hear these stories um, and and understand really what this means in practice. Um, so the Immigrant Defense Project and the Center for Constitutional Rights published an ICE Watch raids map um, that you can look at. It's raidsmap.mdefense.org. There's a website and you can sort of look at where um, ICE arrests have happened, how they happened, what are the circumstances. So that's just one really great way in which we can use the evidence right now that you gather through this video documentation to change minds, to change law, and uh, to change policy. Thank you so much for breaking that down for us. And it appears that we may have actually reached um, the question and answer segment of our program. Uh, I'll pivot over to uh, Polly in case you want to uh, add anything else in regards to some of the work that witness may be doing or if there's anything else you want to say before I open it up for questions. I know that I certainly have a couple for the panel. 
Sure, thank you, Juan. I think just the last point that I want to make is around the, the you know, ethics and safety um, for documenting ice arrest, because it's really important, especially when we're talking about um, a community where identity is, is such a vulnerable topic. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's just really important that as a community, as neighbors, as advocates, we're always coming from a place of do no harm. You know, seeing yourself on or someone you love being verbally or physically abused or having their rights violated, violated or being, you know, torn away from their home or families on camera can be a deeply traumatic experience to live and then have to relive on video. Um, in, in 2015, I actually had the opportunity to run a video advocacy summer program with youth activists in Ferguson, Missouri. And two of two of them were actually Mike Brown Jr.'s younger sisters. And for folks who, who don't know, uh, Mike Brown Jr. was shot and killed by a police officer in, in 2014. And his death, you know, um, sparked worldwide attention and support for the for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and you know, I'll never forget what his sister said to me about how though they're so grateful for all the the love and support their brother and family received, you know, they wish that for every day of their lives for the past two plus years, they didn't have to see a photo of their brother lying on the ground on TV from the worst and, and you know, be reminded of the worst day of their lives. So we have a real ethical responsibility to each other to not further the harm that's already being done to our communities, but instead to be using those images to create impact. And creating impact, you know, it doesn't always mean that you just share those videos right away publicly. In fact, at Witness, we've seen that it can be strategic to actually hold on to your footage or photos and wait for a police department or ICE to make an official statement and then release the video after that as a way to help expose the lies and discrepancies. And so this is, you know, this is why in the We Have Rights video and, and all of our um, resources at Witness, we stress the importance of not just immediately sharing your video on online on social media, but rather to, to pause, to take a breath and think through some of the ethical and safety considerations before you do share your video, whether it's individually with a lawyer or advocacy organization or with the public. I think the very first thing to ask yourself is, will this video re-traumatize anyone? And how can you instead share the video with the person targeted in that footage so that they can be in control of how those images are shared or are not shared? And you know, if, if this isn't an option because the person was arrested or detained or you lost track of them somehow, you can look out for you know local organizations offering advocacy support or legal support, see if they can help. We've actually seen in the past a local Black Lives Matter chapter was able to connect a filmer with the family of the person that um, he had filmed being uh, shot by police. So we know that this is possible. It just takes being a little bit resourceful and reaching out to folks. And then from a safety and security perspective, you know, filming and sharing a video of an immigration arrest publicly without thinking through safety concerns can have dire implications. We we know that Department of Homeland Security, ICE, police, they patrol social media and target people that way. So it's important to ask yourself, could posting this video put people that are featured in the video at risk for retaliation? And one super simple way to help mitigate that risk is to conceal identities using a blurring tool before you post. Um, YouTube has a free blurring tool for videos. Signal, the end-to-end -end encrypted communication app has a, a blurring tool for photos. And there's also a website called Image Scrubber, which is really great for concealing photos as well. And then just last thing, in addition to thinking about the safety of the people featured in the video, um, I think Michael also, ta uh, also talked about this. It's also important to think about your own safety as the filmer. You know, we've seen, especially this past summer during Black Lives Matter protests that people filming were sometimes then made the target of abuse or retaliation. And even though uh, filming law enforcement has been upheld uh, as part of our First Amendment right, we've seen how filming can, like I said, make you the target yourself or even escalate the situation. So your, your own safety and your own risk, um, you know, really depends on you as an individual. It might depend on your own immigration status, your race, your, uh, you know, history with police, et cetera. But it is important to make that assessment beforehand and to just know that no footage is ever worth your safety or the safety of the people that we're trying to protect with our cameras. And, and it's also important to know that if you do decide to share that footage 
publicly, you can share it with an advocacy organization or a journalist and you don't have to have your name attached to it. You can still stay anonymous and help protect yourself, but, but still manage to get the footage into the public. Uh, so I think I'm just going to leave it there for now. Those are just some top line safety and ethical considerations. We'll share a couple uh, resources in the chat with more information that goes a little bit deeper into more of the strategy um, and things to, to think about before you share a video publicly. But those are kind of some top line ones for now. Thank you, Juan. Absolutely. And thank you for making sure that we go over some of the ethical pieces of this as well. Um, I found it quite interesting in terms of, you know, highlighting some of the strategic portions of this. Uh, I know that folks may uh, often be caught up in a moment when it comes down to essentially uh, reactionary times. Uh, oftentimes, I mean, a lot of times I would say, uh, and not to be redundant, time is certainly of the essence, uh, especially when witnessing immigration raids and some of the practices uh, that we have highlighted community and the speech, some of the action. Just to each other and these when it comes down to enforcement and some of the practices that we have with this here today. Um, I want to open it up for questions, um, you know, from the audience and feel free to use the chat option in here. I'll have uh, one of our folks uh, make sure that we source those up. Uh, but before I, I take uh, the first question from the audience, I, I did have uh, just two quick questions for the panels. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, just kind of like to reshape or re-highlight some of the points that were made in here. Uh, the first one being, um, you know, the, the use of cell phone passcodes and passwords. Um, for me, you know, an individual who, you know, uh, has a smartphone, uh, you know, I'll hold it up here right now. Uh, I'm quite familiar with the usage of you know, the face ID or the thumbprint or there's a pass, there's a passcode uh, option in here. But for folks, say, you know, our tios, our abuelas, who may not have a smartphone and may depend on, you know, a flip phone or a much uh, a not so advanced device, uh, are there any sort of protections for those devices? And if so, um, you know, what is the recommendation for, for, for making sure that the data, potentially the recordings or the pictures, Uh, you know, held up in terms of immigration proceedings? Yeah, so um, there's a, there's the question of at the border, sort of when you're entering the United States, how your data, your phone information can be used. Um, and that is a, a bit of a developing area of law. The advice, the general advice is to turn off your thumbprint and your voice um, activation and that helps to protect your data when you're coming in the border. Um, ICE may still seize your, or at that point it'd be CD, um, CBP, may still seize your phone. They may try to coerce you to open it up and to show information on there. Um, but uh, that's something important that you are noting and then can talk to your lawyer about and perhaps like the ACLU or, or a civil liberties organization to figure out how to, to fight that. Um, but it's not totally clear that you have a right, 100% right to privacy there, especially if you have like a voice activation and, and thumbprint. So that's important to know at the border. Um, in terms of internally in the United States, um, ICE can demand your phone uh, they demand all sorts of things all the time, but you don't have to turn over your phone. You don't have to open up your phone. You don't have to give them any information. Again, in an abundance of caution, the advice would be to um, turn off your fingerprint activation and your voice activation because that does create another level of privacy and expectation of privacy in this. And I am not an expert in this area of law. So um, I'm sure there are other people who are more familiar with it, but generally speaking, that does create an a further expectation of privacy, and that can then help to protect your data um, if, if they do seize it. 
Um, but the bottom line is that what ICE generally does is they will knock on your door or bang on your door or approach you in a hallway in an apartment building or on the street and they'll say, show us your ID, give us your phone and make some other demands. And it's important to know that you don't have to do any of those things. Um, and that you can just say, who are you? Uh, am I under arrest? Do you have a warrant for my arrest? And if they don't have a warrant for your arrest and uh, they can't identify you, then you are free to leave. And so you should ask them, am I free to leave? Um, and we have some other videos. That's why it's really important to watch some of the other videos that we have rights videos. And there's lots of great information on the ACLU website. I'm sure Witness has a lot of information about this as well on their website. Um, so that is what's, I think, the most, the reason I wanted to highlight this sort of new ICE trend that we heard is that ICE wasn't previously demanding people's cell phones. And now they are. And you don't have to turn that over. You don't have to go to your bedroom if they're in your house and bring them your cell phone. Um, you can just say, no, thank you, or no, or uh, not answer. Um, they don't now have a right to that information. I'll just add one thing to that. Um, one tactic that we've seen be used successfully is uh, folks uh, have their footage automatically backed up to a cloud service like Dropbox or you know Google Drive. Of course, if people are concerned with their privacy data, etc., um, I would encourage them to look into the different policies that those platforms have uh, in terms of handing over footage or information to law enforcement. But we have seen that be a tactic that folks can use, say, if their phone gets confiscated, stolen, broken, etc. There's still a layer of protection for your footage um, so that it's not completely disappeared even if your phone's taken. Thank you for that. I think one more question in here from me and I see that we're getting questions from the audience is essentially and this may be a question for you know, to kind of expand on what you were saying Polly which was um, in terms of the information that's being shared um, for some of the people that in the audience who may not be as familiar with some of the uh, ins and outs that you know something called metadata is in in the function of recording and sharing these these videos or these photographs You kind of broke up for me there, but I think I got the gist of it. Basically, what is metadata and why should we be concerned with it? Is that the gist of it? Cool. Yes, <laughs> that's correct. Awesome. Uh, so metadata, I guess the simplest way to describe it is that it's data about your data. So for video, I know that sounds ridiculous, but uh, for video, this means data or information about the video. So, you know, it could be things like the date uh, the video was recorded, the location. So some of that information, some of that metadata can be added by a person, like in a video description or a caption. And some metadata is created automatically by your phone. And it's this latter type of automatic metadata that's created is, it is, that's the type of metadata that people are more concerned with um, because you know if you are concerned with being targeted or retaliated against or incriminating a person or a place metadata that's automatically generated by your device like the gps coordinates can be concerning because it can link you back to that place even if you do share something anonymously even if you do blur images um so i'm I, I'm gonna, I can't, I'm not gonna go too into detail about this. I can share a resource to, on, to explain more about what metadata is, but basically most social media platforms actually get rid of metadata when you share content using their platform. Um, but some companies like Facebook collect metadata from uploaded footage and then store that information, which means that it could technically be vulnerable from you know subpoenas from law enforcement. So again, if you've done a risk assessment and you are a more high risk person, um, and you are concerned about an image or a video being tied back to you, 
it's best to try to get rid of that information, get rid of that metadata um, before you share it publicly or just not share it at all. And when we're talking about getting rid of metadata, people say scrub. So if you've heard people say scrubbing metadata, um, it was a term that was used a lot this past summer during protests. That basically just means getting rid of that information. Um, so for, for photos, one really easy option could be to take a screenshot of your photo and then upload that screenshot instead of the original photo. So the new metadata created will indicate that it's a screenshot or that it's been edited, but it, it will, it'll no longer have the original GPS coordinates. Uh, you could also use that website that I mentioned earlier called Image Scrubber. Really great website. I've used it uh, on my phone and on a, a browser before, on my desktop before. Um, and it allows you to blur images and also get rid of metadata for photos. Um, and then for video, I think just the easiest way to get rid of metadata is to open the video in a video editing software and then re-export that video as a new file. Uh, Handbrake is a really is a free and really easy tool to use on your phone. Um, or you could also just screen record the video on your phone and then share the screen recording and that'll basically yield similar results to if you were to um, screenshot a photo. Uh, those are really simple solutions, not totally foolproof. So if you are in a high risk situation or you are concerned, you know, consider not posting it or consulting a lawyer or digital security expert. But again, it really depends on who you are, what your risk profile is. But that is essentially what metadata is. I'll share a little YouTube video we have at Witness that goes that explains uh, what metadata is even more. And there, just know that there are ways to um, to account for this and deal with this. Thank you so much for that. Really insightful and helpful, and definitely covers the points that I was uh, hoping you would cover. We do have a question from our audience in here. So. so um, how should you ask an officer to identify themselves if you're filming them, whether you're unsure if their eyes, especially if they're outside? I, um, I'm just going to restate the question because it broke up again. How should you ask an officer to identify themselves when you're filming them if you're unsure if they're ICE or police, um, for example, outside of a courthouse? So um, what we advise, what we have done are some of our attorneys, uh, for example, is, is literally walked up to the officer and said, are you ICE? Um, are you NYPD? Um, my experience is that NYPD, um, the New York Police Department, for example, will usually identify themselves and say, yes, we're NYPD if you ask them affirmatively. Um, that's, that's not foolproof, but usually they, they will say yes. Um, what we have found to be a little bit more evasive is when we say, are you ICE? And it is an ICE officer. They, they in some cases, they have given a retort such as, I don't need to tell you, who are you? and turned it back around. Um, that's not to uplift NYPD and their practices, um, but I do think that that is helpful to know that uh, you, in our limit, in our experience, usually um, in the courthouses, for example, it's difficult to tell if a plainclothes detective or NYPD officer is ICE or, or um, is ICE or NYPD. And, ICE will specifically wear vests as Polly showed in that video, in the photos that say police. They are trying to be evasive and, and vague. And there are examples where they have called up uh, people who they're looking for, family members and said, I'm a detective from this precinct around the corner. They, are, they may actively um, misidentify themselves or, um, at, or be just vague in a misleading way. So it is difficult to tell. Um, but the important, I mean, you can try to probe, you could ask for a badge number, you could ask for a name. Um, importantly though, is that you do not interfere with the arrest because, uh, any type of law enforcement or ICE, if they call themselves law enforcement, um, they usually have weapons and we have seen an increased instance of ICE using guns. Um, as a threatening tactic. For example, we had a client where ICE walked up to them on the side of the street and put a gun into their side and said, we're ICE, come with us, we're arresting you. 
So it is very important that if you're witnessing that you don't interfere with the arrest and you can ask questions, but you may just be ignored and to not really to not push that issue too much. You can also speak to the person who's being arrested and you can tell them, don't forget you have a right not to give over information. You have a right to remain silent. What you could ask them, in some cases we've asked them what is their name so that we can try to figure out how to help them. Do you have an attorney? Um, asking them if they have an attorney is, is a better tactic probably than asking them their name because in some cases their name may be an identifying factor that could help ICE. So if you're around a courthouse, you might say, do you have a lawyer? What's that lawyer's name? I'm going to go try to find that lawyer. That sort of those sorts of questions. But again, I wouldn't probe too much um, in terms of trying to figure out if it's ICE or not. Um, and in fact, if you ask and ICE is evasive or you make a note that they just have a badge on that says police, that actually could be helpful in the grand scheme of showing uh, ICE's tactics are, um, are, in my opinion, inhumane and, um, and purposely deceptive in a way that threatens public safety and human rights. I just wanted to add something to that quickly. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, that even if there's some loophole policy in ICE's, you know, tactics manual that says that they technically don't have to identify themselves or they can wear a police vest, um, doesn't mean that it's right, right? And so part of using video is exposing this um, so that we can make those changes. So it's not always just about violating the law, it's also about reevaluating what is the law and what's the policy and how can we be better? Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for those answers. Um, it seems that we have not collected another question from our audience. Um, so I wanted to make sure that in, our, in, in the closing part of our program, I restated that, uh, you know, for our audience who's watching this either right now or in posterity, please make sure that you make use of these resources and help us share these videos because we depend on people like yourself to become not just involved, but the active participant in helping other people access this information. All of these videos can be found at www.wehaverights.us. Again, that's wehaverights.us. I wanted to thank our panel for convening and inviting me today to be your moderator. Uh, I know that we may have had some technical glitches here and there, but I appreciate as well our technical team who has helped us and guided us through this process. Again, thank you so much for this uh, information. Thank you to uh, all of our panelists for sharing their knowledge and expertise. And I wanted to make sure that media, that media tank, Barian Strategies, look at Brooklyn Defense Services, uh, the Beverly Collective, Witness, uh, definitely got a shout out for everybody uh, who uh, helped put this program on here today, today together. So again, thank you so much. My name is Juan Escalante. I've been today's moderator, and I look forward to potentially joining you in another segment in here with our panel. Thank you all for joining. And we are clear.
Congratulations, everyone. That was really, really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, everyone. Yeah. Congrats, you guys. Thank you. Great panel. That was fantastic, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Pau brought up the point, and I apologize, I might have misunderstood this. I thought we were going to maybe share the Spanish version as well. So um, if we are following up with folks who attended, could we share that link for them? Sure. Awesome. Yeah, that would be great. And then we can share all the resources as well. Yeah, because I mentioned on the interpretation line that we would be sharing the Spanish video. Okay. And so one thing just to let everybody know, so we also shared the videos, both the English and the Spanish language um, video with our Brick Free Speech channel. So those are gonna be airing in January. Um, so what I'll do is once I get a notification from our programming team about when that video will air, I will share that with you all um, to share out as well and let everybody know that it's gonna be sharing, it's gonna be shared on um, the Free Speech channels, which is the uh, Brooklyn's public, um, public access channel. Um, and one thing that I had mentioned to Abby is thinking about in the future, if you would like for those other videos in the We Have Rights series to screen on our free speech channels, we can definitely do that as well. Nia, we would definitely like that. Okay, great. Yeah, so we can talk more about setting up um, a time for those to all show in one block is like a content programming. Great. Awesome. Thank you all for um, your patience and, you know, navigating uh, any technical difficulties we had and just, you know, the variable of the, the, the internet. <laughs> so, um, but it was really great program. And um, thank you for uh, sharing uh, so much relevant information. I was, um, uh, you, you thought of so many things that I like the, like the blurring out and that's a lot of great resources. So thank you for sharing those things. Well, thank you so much, Brick, for inviting us to join today. Thank you, and thank you to Pau and Cristobal for helping thank with you. Uh, language justice. And I really thank like you. that that phrasing, and I'm going to use it from now on. Yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Oh, is uh, is uh, interpretation live interpretation available on other platforms or just Zoom? Um, I think that there's a few of them that are available that do have it. Some are more expensive than others to add that on. Um, there are others um, like Blue Jeans that you can add other applications to it. Um, but I think at this point, none are as seamless, uh, even with, you know, not being made for interpretation that is in the way that Zoom exists. But I think yeah. that Zoom right now is probably the most seamless option. We've also done events where folks have a separate conference line and we're also interpreting it on a uh, separate conference line, but that kind of goes against us wanting to, to practice language justice and have everyone right. in one space and right. hear everyone's right. voice. Right, all right, awesome, thank you. Yeah, for sure. All right, thanks everybody, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. everybody. All right, all right. have a wonderful have time. A and then, um, Abby, we'll continue to be in contact. Sounds good. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was wonderful. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a great time. On to the next one. I was going to say one <laughs> down, three more to go. All right. Well, you have a restful day, and I'll see you tomorrow morning for tech. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Dan. All right. Thank you. Bye.